الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه قولي أمين يا رب So I want to discuss today inshallah the issue of what you know we have let's say an authentic hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the one side and a mazhab or some of the mazahibs have an opinion contrary to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so how do we understand this from an Islamic perspective um, generally when we use the word hadith uh, generally when we use the word dalil it generally means the Quran and more specifically even so generally nowadays when you say the word dalil it means more specifically the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because nowadays people feel that the hadith defines the Quran rather than the Quran defining the entire deen however that's a discussion for another top and another day but I'm going to help you decide for yourself if you choose if you would choose an opinion of a mazhab or an opinion of a hadith that you believe that hadith then reflects the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so I'm going to give you something to consider and then you decide which way you would take it but what I, at the end of this I would hope that happens as a result of this at the end is that you have a greater appreciation for both sides of the equation you have a better understanding of why someone would choose one position over the other so uh, let me just draw this over here um, inshallah if we can just take this so if we take Islamic history you know we have uh, what the Prophet وسلم, said Khairul uh, Qurun Qarni so this is let's say the first generation okay first generation that's the generation of the prophet and his companions second generation and then after that you have third generation okay so the tradition of the prophet itself defines this to be the best time period now Imam Bukhari comes into the picture of collecting the hadith for example if we take if we start from Sahih Bukhari we are talking about after the three generations after about uh, you know somebody uh, here uh, and, and, and what's very important is the mazahibs were formed in this time period okay and particularly Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik were formed in this time period okay so you have a very authentic hadith, let's say going back, let's say 320 years after the Prophet, let's say it's in Sahih Muslim. Okay, But the opinion of, let's say, Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa, both of them living, and this is the other point, is that they are living in the two major cities where the greatest number of companions were. Therefore, those two cities almost represent like the ijma' of the companions. And if in both cities of the cities, meaning... Uh, Medina where Imam Malik was and Kufa where Abu Hanifa was if both of the people of both of the cities agreed you almost have an ijma uh, from, from the perspective of the sunnah established by the companions you know, the athar of the companions of the Prophet so we have Medina and then Kufa and Kufa is represented by the opinions of the Hanafi fiqh and uh, the Medina is represented by the opinions of Imam Malik and so what we get as a result is a very strong uh, a very strong opinion here now this opinion may lack evidence but it doesn't lack historical evidence in other words if you're gonna say the only form of correct opinion is a chain of narrations so somebody says that somebody says that somebody says that somebody says that the Prophet said and let's say this is authentic okay and let's say this comes from from uh, Damascus, from Sham. And there's the same hadith coming from Makkah. Somebody said that somebody said, somebody said, somebody said that the Prophet said such and such. Okay? Pretty strong. I, you know, two people from two different cities having a chain of narrations going back about 300 years to the Prophet saying very similar words to each other. 
Okay. But at the same time, over here you have the opinion of people that were closer to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they had a better, closer access to the Qur'an and Sunnah from its point of origin perspective. Okay, so which one would you choose? Would you feel safer going with the ulama, with the khair al-qurun, thumma al-ladhina yalunahum? Would you feel better following the tabi'een and their opinion as an ijma, or would you go with a single narration of hadith? So this is really, you know, the question of hadith versus the mazhab. This is the question you need to answer. It is a historical question. The, if somebody gives you an opinion closer to the Prophet, like Imam Malik, the golden chain of narration from Nawafir to Ibn Umar to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, three people between, you know, two people between Imam Malik and the Prophet And so Imam Malik forms an opinion in a time period where there is a very short distance. Whereas Imam Bukhari, uh, chain of narrations may go up to nine people, seven people, seven to nine people. So, are you gonna? So basically, you have two advantages being on this side, uh, being with a mazhab, particularly if there's an ijma of a mazhab. You have number one, the benefit of ijma. Now that's a separate issue. What is the benefit? Yani, uh, the benefit of the ijma, particularly for those people who were closer to the generation of the Prophet okay? So you have that benefit. And that in itself is a dalil to say that somebody from this time period said, has, had, held this time, had, had held this opinion and he was known to be a scholar amongst the scholars of Islam. And he was known to be the shiyukh amongst the shiyukh of Islam. Not only the four mazahibs per se, but so many of the great, you know, Thufyan uh, Athori, Thufyan Ra'ina, so on and so forth. All these, uh, you know, great scholars of Islam, if they are of this time period, their opinion counts as a dalil in itself. And if it becomes a school of thought, meaning that city has an ijma upon that opinion, and the schools, uh, the, the scholars of that city, where the greatest number of the companions were, also have a, a large number of following of that opinion, that's a very strong dalil in itself. Okay, but here you go directly to the sayings of the Prophet and you are able to then determine, this is a whole science in itself, but let's say you're able to determine which ahadith correctly represent the sunnah of the Prophet. In other words, you have been able to identify the ahadith that are mutawatir, that are authentic, they have a strong chain of narrations. Well, if the Prophet said something, then can there be any doubt? You know, there can be no doubt. There's no second guessing. The Prophet said it, and that's it. And there's proof he said it. How can, and particularly for me, you know, let's say if there's a narration coming from Damascus, from Sham, another narration coming from Mecca, and let's say another narration of a similar sort, let's say coming from Basra, okay? And you have that chain of narrations. And the wordings are generally similar, okay? So you have three cities saying the prophet said exactly the same thing okay the chain of narrations are because we're not these are not living these are not people living in where they're texting each other oh you know i have this chain of narrations these are people who didn't know each other totally different chain of narrations point of origin may be the same but then how it develops further in each city is different right or sometimes the point of origin meaning that with the companion that's narrating it on abu Hurairah or on aisha you know may be different also but anyway, coming down to the statement that they claim the Prophet made, right? Th there is no doubt the Prophet said this statement. Now there is only a question of, is your legal interpretation, meaning the Prophet definitely said this, but what is its legal value? That's also a subject for another time that I will discuss. But I only want you to be able to appreciate that these, almost the, the mazahib, the people who hold the opinion of a mazhab or people who hold uh, an opinion based upon different mazahibs versus the chain of narrations, these are checks and balances within the sharia. Meaning, the fiqah was made first and the hadith as a subject came later, meaning in terms of its documentation. And so when the fiqah came in terms of the chapters of tahara and salah and then, you know, the chapters of saum and hajj and bayur and so on and so forth, all those things, they were developed and codified 
and made into schools of thoughts before the emergence of hadith literature as we know it today. And so therefore, they are checks and balances to one another. They, they, it was almost like there was a backup system. The hadith methodology and the hadith sciences, they are a backup system to the, to the madhahibs that have the benefit of being closer and have the benefit of an ijma of a greater and a better generation than the generation that's here. Okay? And then, uh, on the other hand, uh, the, 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 the hadith, they have a, the benefit of uh, a type of certainty that cannot necessarily be attained because of the lack of direct evidence from the opinions that are held over here. We just know that they held this opinion and we believe that we can trust that opinion over here. It's more a matter of trust, but it is a historical fact that people closer to the Prophet held this opinion. Okay, and then as you move away, and this is why um, you can see Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik are more influenced by their by the people and the scholars around them because they were great scholars. They were they were giants. Okay, and then as you move down from Imam Shafi to Ahmad bin Hanbal, you find that they are they no longer have those giants around them. So now they are leaning towards the. Uh, relying on the chain of narrations more and more and that's why you have the Muslim Imam, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal anyhow so I just wanted to bring this to your attention and to show you the benefits the benefits of being in on the opinion of a mazhab and the benefits of being on the opinion of a hadith literature now here this is the problem however however if you read hadith and you come to opinion X that totally contradicts anything in the past of our scholarship. It contradicts everything of all the mazahibs and it contradicts all of the opinions of the muhaddithin, so on and so forth. Now you may be in trouble. In a sense, you are taking a risk. You may be sure of your risk, but you're taking a risk. Okay? So I just want to end over here. أقول قول هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم وليساءل المسلمين والمسلمات السلام عليكم